In the previous video I explained the idea behind probabilistic generative models, where we want to obtain a full probabilistic parameterization for the data, as then we can rely on decision theory to make optimal decisions. And again Gaussian distributions prove to be useful in this setting, as then when the covariance matrices are shared, we obtain linear decision boundaries, and this results in a linear discriminant analysis framework. So what we did, we defined how we can parameterize our distributions. And now in this video, we are actually going to find the optimal set of parameters via the maximum likelihood principle. Now the setting is that we have this data set of inputs with corresponding binary targets. So in this video, we're going to consider the KS2 case uh, for now. Um, this means, so let me draw that. So we have a bunch of data samples of these X's and some of those X's came from, uh, well, a target one from class one. So I'm going to indicate it with blue. And some of these data points came from, um, well, the, 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 the second class. So the red points belong to class two, uh, let's say T is one, and the blue points belong to T is zero, so the first class. Okay, so we have data points, so these X's and the corresponding targets, which I color coded uh, over here. Now our objective is to recover uh, the Gaussian distributions or to recover the actual distributions that generated this data. We want to recover the joint distribution and we're going to do that via Gaussian conditional densities in combination with priors, because then the joint probabilities were obtained via the product of these uh, conditionals with the priors. Then we decided to model these uh, Gaussian conditional densities via a uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution. So each of these Gaussians, so we want to uh, recover a distribution for this uh, class, which has a particular mu1 and can have a particular covariance matrix, um, sigma1. The same for the second distribution. So also for this one, we want to recover the parameters for the Gaussian, which have some mean mu2 and it has some covariance matrix um, sigma2. Now we already saw that uh, when we model these conditionals with different uh, covariance matrices we end up with quadratic decision boundaries um, so that leads to quadratic discriminant analysis uh, but uh, we want to keep it for now simple uh, so we choose to share the covariance matrices and that leads to linear discriminant analysis. So let me just quickly make this drawing again. So what we're now going to do, we're going to assume that each conditional, like both conditionals share the same covariance matrix, but each distribution has its own uh, mean parameter mu1 and mu2. And if we do it this way, then it turns out that in the end, we obtain a linear decision boundary. And so we call this framework a linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so in this setting, both have the same covariance matrix, uh, capital sigma. And I drew this uh, covariance matrix uh, as, as, a, as if it was an isotropic uh, uh, covariance matrix. In the general case, this isn't the case, but in this particular example, I will show via the upcoming derivations that in the end um, these covariance matrices uh, will turn out to be isotropic even though these separate covariance matrices are uh, anisotropic. Okay, but that's our objective. Uh, so this is how we're going to model the data with two of such uh, Gaussian uh, conditional distributions and we're set out to find the proper parameters uh, mu1, mu2 and the covariance matrix. Uh, but we also need to re recover the priors and we're going to model the priors with just a number because we have two classes. So that means this number represents the probability for, uh, like the overall probability of observing a data point from class one, will be represented with Q. And then for the other class, this will be one minus Q. Okay, and then we have a full probabilistic description of my data, namely the joint probability uh, for an XN for class one will be given by Q, so the prior, times, well, my uh, Gaussian distribution parameterized with the mu1 and a covariance matrix. And for the other class, it will be one minus Q 
times the normal distribution xn with its own mean but the same covariance matrix. Okay, so we're uh, going to pick our parameters. So we have these parameters q, mu uh, 1 and 2 and sigma and we're going to choose this based on the max maximum likelihood principle. Now recall that the likelihood uh, is given by uh, basically the joint likelihood of all my data points, uh, which we assume to be uh, IID. So they all come from the same distribution, which we're going to model uh, with this product of, um, well, the conditional and the prior. Okay, so the likelihood is then obtained by filling in these, uh, these data points, the XN and the TNs in our prior and the conditionals evaluating this and taking the product over all my data points, right? Because that gives me the joint likelihood for these data samples being observed given my uh, distribution. And I said we're modeling the distribution with these Gaussians and the priors, which were just given by numbers. Okay, and then we param parameterize the joint in such a way that for whenever T uh, equals one, so for one particular class, for class one, um, this is what I'm evaluating. This is what the, the joint distribution looks like. And for the other class where T is zero, this is what it looks like. And now I'm going to make use of the fact that I'm working with a binary classification uh, method such that my labels, I'm going to code it with one or zero. And this allows me to apply this sort of selection mechanism here, right? So for whenever class T is one, this thing will be one, I'm going to select Indeed, the joint probability for class one and my xn. And whenever um, tn is zero, then this thing, well, something to the power of zero will evaluate to one, so this thing uh, is ignored. But this thing will be active because then we have one minus zero, so it means for t is zero, we select uh, the probabilities for class two. Okay, so that then gives us this uh, nice expression for the likelihood, which is formulated as the product of all these uh, distributions where I select the appropriate distribution for the corresponding class by taking these powers. And this was then the joint for class one. So the prior for class one is Q times uh, the class conditional distribution. And then the same for the second uh, uh, class, namely the prior one minus Q times the corresponding class conditional. Okay, and we've done this many times before, right? In the regression case, and the same principles also now apply in this probabilistic setting for classification. So instead of optimizing the likelihood, we're going to make it a bit more convenient for ourselves and we're going to work with the log likelihood. And well, the log of the likelihood, so we have this product of all these individual uh, data point likelihoods that becomes a sum over all my data points. And then we have a product of these two terms. So this product also seems, uh, s splits in a separate sum. So that's what we see over here. And then if we focus on, on one of these distributions, so t to the power n, if I take the log of something to the power tn, I can take this power up front. That's what's happening here. And uh, so if this q, this factor, so this is again a product, so it splits, well, in these two terms. So this represents the log of uh, my first uh, joint uh, uh, probability. Okay, so the log of this thing gives me this over here and the log of this thing gives me this part over here. Okay, so now we're going to maximize the log likelihood um, by the principles that we're used to. So we computed the derivative with respect to the parameter uh, that we consider and set this to zero and then solve it. And we start, start off by estimating uh, Q, so uh, the prior uh, probability. Okay, so we're trying to find an estimate for Q and let's mark the terms where I observe this Q that's here and that's here. So that's what I'm going to focus on now. And I'm going to deriv take the derivative with respect to Q. So we still have the sum over all data points and it's one to N. Uh, the derivative of this thing, the derivative of the log is one over Q. So that gives me tn over q plus, uh, similarly here we can compute the derivative, one minus tn, one over one minus q times minus one actually, right? Because I'm computing the chain rule. So that's one over the thing inside and then the derivative, what's inside the log with respect to q, that's minus one. So uh, that shows up over here. Okay, let's combine this. So that's the sum, n is one to n, tn one minus q 
minus 1 minus tn times q divided by q1 minus q, okay? Okay, so let's quickly expand the numerator and simplify it a bit. Okay, where we see that this product of tn with q cancels out, so we can write this entire derivative of the log likelihood, uh, the derivative with respect to q as n is 1 to n, tn minus q, q1 minus q. And this is what we're going to set to 0, and now we're going to solve it for q. Okay, so this means actually that we're solving n is 1 to n, q is, and then the sum n is 1 to n of tn. And we could do this uh, because I'm assuming that q is unequal to 0, and I'm also assuming that q is unequal to 1, because then I can ignore this term and really focus on this. And this makes sense, right? We're looking for the prior probability, and so we're, uh, we're actually going to assume some number between 0 and 1. Um, okay, so that gives me this expression over here. Q doesn't depend on n, so this thing actually is going to evaluate to n times Q, and that will give us the final estimate, the maximum likelihood estimate for Q, which is given by the Q maximum likelihood is given by 1 over n, and then the sum for n is 1 to n of Tn. And Tn is a binary thing that is either 0 or 1. So really what I'm doing is I'm counting the number of times Tn is 1. Uh, so this actually gives me the ratio n1 over n. So like the total number of times that I'm observing a class 1 um, in the context of my total number of uh, observations. Okay, great. So we have obtained the maximum likelihood solution for Q. And it really is the fraction of times that I'm observing um, class 1. And that's also what it represents, right? So Q represents the prior probability of observing class 1. Okay, now we can follow the same recipe for the other parameters. Uh, let's focus now on mu1. Uh, where do we see mu1? That's this term. So we're going to focus on computing the derivative of this term. Meaning I have to compute the derivative of Tm times the log of my Gaussian, di Gaussian distribution. Now the Gaussian distribution consisted of this uh, front factor plus this exponential. The front factor doesn't depend on mu, so we're going to ignore that for now. And then we take the log of this exponential. And that's just the thing, what was inside the exponent, right? So we're going to compute the derivative of this quadratic form with respect to mu. And actually we've done that before in one of the exercises and I put a note about this on, on canvas, but it's not too hard to show then that this, that this derivative evaluates to dn times xn minus mu1 transpose sigma inverse. And this is what we're going to set to zero. And actually I can write it in this form because um, sigma is symmetric. Okay, please refer to the notes on canvas if you don't believe me uh, on this. So, okay, so this is derivative and we set it to zero and recall that in our convention, the derivative of our multivariate variable is going to be a row vector. So actually this has to be uh, the zero row vector. Okay, now this implies actually that we're solving for um, the sum n is one to n of tn mu one equals the sum n is 1 to n tn times xn, where this step really comes from the fact that this uh, sigma term doesn't determine, uh, well, the solution. Uh, this thing is actually positive definite, so it will never be this term that causes this to be zero. Okay, so here this step was based on the fact that sigma is positive definite. And then what I did, I moved uh, the xn terms to the right and kept mu1 on, on the left hand side. And that gives me uh, this over here. And this in turn implies, um, because what I'm doing here is a sum over n, where tn is either 0 or 1, mu1 doesn't depend um, on n. 
So this actually gives me n1, so the number of times t n was equal to 1 times mu1 equals uh, this sum over here, t n x n, and we can move the n1 to the other side. Okay, so this really tells me that the maximum likelihood solution for mean 1 is given by 1 over n1 sum n is 1 to n uh, t n x n. And this is really the sample mean, this is really the sample mean of all my points within this class for which tn equals 1. Right, because I'm ignoring all the points for which tn is 0, because then this product is 0. Okay, so this is really the mean over my points in class 1. And I have the same for uh, mu2, same derivation. I see that this is going to be the sample mean and it's one of all points in the class two, right? Where this term is one whenever Tn is zero and all the other terms are ignored. So this, uh, the mean for um, my second class is given by uh, the sample mean over the points in that class. Okay, great. So we now also have the maximum likelihood solution for the means. Uh, let's go back to the first slide. So that means now we already have obtained mu1 and mu2. So really the sample means over the points in class 1 gives me mu1 and the same the mean over the points in class 2 gives me mu2. Now finally we can do the same for the covariance matrix and once we've done that we have a complete description of our data uh, given our, our Gaussian model. So the recipe is the same. We take the derivative with respect to the covariance matrix. So now it actually becomes a bit more complicated because now I'm taking this a tensor derivative or this matrix derivative of the log of the likelihood which means I have to take the derivative uh, of these terms and these terms which in the end means that I have to take the derivative of this over here and now I'm not going to write this out because it takes a bit too long and it's a bit distracting from uh, the point that I'm trying to make and so I keep it short here um, there is some short derivation in the book of Bishop, so let me write that down in Bishop 4.2.2. Um, but I also included a note on Canvas uh, in which one of the previous uh, teachers, uh, Rianne van der Berg, uh, wrote out how to compute this uh, matrix derivative. So if you're interested in this, um, please look at, take a look at uh, the book and her notes. Um, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that if we do this and we set it to zero and then solve for the covariance matrix, we get the expression that we see over here, that we see here below. And this is a really nice result actually. We see that uh, the, the maximum likelihood solution for the covariance matrix uh, consists of the sample covariance of the points within class one. So this is going to be and sigma 1 partly consists of the covariance matrix of class 2. Right, this is the covariance matrix uh, when we're dealing with a discrete data set. And my final maximum likelihood uh, covariance will be a weighted average of these two covariance matrices, where uh, the first one is weighted with the number of times uh, my, uh, I observe my data points in this class, plus my weight, so the number of times um, my data point lies in, in the second class. So my maximum likelihood solution will be a combination of these two covariance matrices. So if we then go back to the first slide, so we were estimating these uh, uh, distributions with Gaussians and we said we're going to share the covariance matrix, uh, so they will be the same. Uh, it turns out that this sigma will be a weighted average of these two covariance matrices. And what I did in this example, I plotted these points, so I sort of assumed that these points had this uh, covariance matrix anisotropic in one direction and uh, this one is anisotropic in the other direction and the average of the two uh, will cancel out these anisotropies and will lead to a uh, well, isotropic covariance uh, matrix. Okay um, so I, I want to stress now that um, I took this as an example but in the general case um, the resulting covariance matrix, matrix does not have to be isotropic, right? If this distribution was isotropic also, and isotropic also in this direction, just like this one, then, well, the average of the two will also be uh, anisotropic in this direction. Uh, but the main point is that these sigmas uh, 
are the same and that will re result in a linear decision boundary. Okay, so really that wraps it up for this uh, maximum likelihood approach for determining these modeling parameters. Um, so the, the idea was we had these data points coming from class one, let's say to distribute it like this and we have a point of class two. Let me now draw it also maybe with a covariance matrix, uh, which is anisotropic. Okay, then um, the mean of the Gaussian distribution for this uh, class will be given by the sample mean for the points in that class. Uh, the mean for this will be given by the sample mean, well, of that class. So those were the maximum likelihood solution solutions given over here, okay? And uh, then we also want to uh, estimate this covariance matrix. And it turns out that this covariance matrix will be a um, weighted sum of this covariance matrix. So let's call it a uh, covariance matrix for class one, a weighted sum with the covariance matrix for class two. And now I drew them actually to be mostly similar. So that means that in the end, my weighted average of this covariance matrix will also look a lot like this. Okay, so the covariance matrix, uh, the maximum likelihood solution for the covariance matrix was the weighted average of these two separate covariance uh, matrices. And now that, that tells me then that in the end, because I have two Gaussians with the same covariance matrix that my decision boundary will be linear. And then finally for this full probabilistic setting, we also had to compute uh, the prior probabilities. And these are simply computed via the fraction of or the number of times that I observe data points in one class. Okay, and then all of this together gives me a nice description for the joint probabilities, uh, which evaluate for, for class one is given as follows and evaluate for class two is given as follows. Okay, and then a really final remark, this whole framework was called linear discriminant analysis because the final result of my model uh, will lead to a linear decision boundary. And I showed before uh, that it comes from the fact that now uh, my posterior distributions uh, for the classes are given in the following form. So this is still the, the binary case. So we had this linear model, which we then pulled through a logistic sigmoid. And this linear model can now also be expressed in uh, the identities or the, the entities that we just derived, namely uh, the maximum likelihood solution for this linear model would then be given by the covariance inverse times the difference between the two uh, model averages. And then we have also uh, this bias term expressed in these same components that we just computed. So we really have a full solution to our um, model. And now we can make predictions with this. So whenever we have a new data point X prime, we're just going to ev evaluate the posterior distribution. And whenever it's larger than a half, then we say it belongs to class one. And if it's lower than a half, then we say it belongs to class two. Okay, now uh, purely thinking in this linear model over here, this classification boundary is saying that it's larger than a half actually corresponds to checking whenever my linear model for this given X prime. So I just evaluate this linear model is bigger than zero. So that's the only thing I need to check if I want to decide whether this point lies in class one or in class two. Okay, so there's some clear advantages to this linear uh, discriminant analysis framework. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the model parameters can be derived analytically in closed form. So that's summarized over here. And once we have that, we have a full parametric probabilistic description of my data and we can use it to make decisions. And the decisions rules are very simple by this linear model. Now, there are also some disadvantages to linear discriminant analysis. And I think the most important one is that the Gaussian distributions are very uh, sensitive to outliers, meaning that if I have a data point in the red class somewhere over here, then that really induces a great shift in the mean in this direction. And actually the same in the covariance matrix, it will become uh, distorted. So this Gaussian framework is actually quite sensitive to outliers. Uh, another thing is, and I'll get back to that uh, later on, but it heavily relies on handcrafted features. So if I go to higher dimensional spaces, I want to work with basis functions and um, I have to make choices there and that complicates uh, things a bit. And, and finally, a remark, which we also actually saw in 
the linear regression case, the same here in the linear classification case, is that the maximum likelihood solutions are quite prone to overfitting, right? Because in this uh, maximum likelihood approach, I so far I didn't consider any regularization terms.